All right, guys, our main Wyoming rifle elk hunt is over and it was extremely successful for Josh and I. So we're gonna fill you in just a nice recap of what happened. We'll try to remember as best we can day by day. It's about 500 miles to come up here. It's about seven, seven and a half hours from my house. Came in, got unloaded, spent the night, woke up in the morning, and the uh, first place we went to was looked really promising. The trailhead, like usual, had 10 horse trailers there, but all the windows were frosted over, so we figured all those guys are 10 miles deep, and there was two, two trailheads coming off of that, so we started out and walked out that, and we heard a bull bugling, and... Got into a whole bunch of elk sign, didn't see anything that day. Um, it's just starting to explore and understand that coming to a new area is so challenging, so difficult. I spent a lot of time e-scouting. So <clears throat> that one, the first morning was, I think, a success, a good area. But the next morning, we had a great big lake and took us up to Timberline. It was a gorgeous area. And uh, again, pretty good sized trailhead with quite a few horse trailers on it. And we went in about two and a half miles deep with Joe and Jim and uh, got up close to Timberline and just, it looked gore it was absolutely gorgeous country. We saw lots of deer sign, we weren't seeing any elk sign. We kind of checked that one off the list. And that's kind of what you have to do with a new area. Is you mm -hmm. just kind of, you have your plans and you don't know until you get here, um, which one's, you know, gonna start materializing. It was Sunday night and you had just come back from just hunting, up. hunting with your brother. Look what, look what the CAC drug in. All the way from Southern Colorado. Driving all day yesterday right. and all day today. I'm gonna go drop into this burn and see what we can see tonight before the sun goes down. A little windy, not like what you like, but see what happens. We took him out on a the same spine that Will and I had gone to. Went out on that and we sat down and man, Dale was eagle eye on a spotting scope. Didn't take him about ten minutes and he's found. I got, I got lucky. I got lucky. I was, I was looking back this uh, probably west and kind of got bored with that that view so i started looking back the opposite direction 180 degrees opposite i had just sat down and i was actually starting just to pan with my binoculars and i saw something and it was uh, 1200 1500 yards i don't know a thousand yards away at least and um i just uh, could make out this animal's body up against this light colored background and so I grabbed my spotting scope really quick and look and I locate it and, and uh, sure enough it's elk. And I see one, it's one cow, but I start looking and up behind and above her are multiple elk and there's a decent sized bull. So I shoot just a real quick video so you can kind of see them. All right guys, we glassed up some elk. One looks like a small five point or four point. Heard them about a thousand yards away. And he had 15 minutes of light, if that. I look at Josh, he looks at me, and we both have an understanding look. Yeah, we're gonna have to go down and up, and down and up, and down and up, with these, like this, and like this, and like this. And you know, we just strap up, and we just go. And, the, and we were hauling yeah. fast. And so I ran back up to Dale, and by the time I got to Dale, he'd had everything packed up in his backpack all ready to go, and we just dove off. And it was elk, we call it elk speed, where we go as fast as you can possibly go, which is not really as fast as an elk, but we call it elk speed or beast mode. We sat down on that ridge and I pulled out the binoculars and uh, pulled out the camera and it was, man, it gets dark so fast. It does. So. I mean, we, could, we could see the elk just a little bit. Just, you'd see pieces of them and I can see some legs and I can see a, like a pile of elk legs, like they were all just meshed together and they were moving. And then it just kept getting darker and darker, and you could see kind of elk drop off here, drop off here, but we never got that nice, clean broadside mm -mm. shot at all. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of cool that all that happened, and as we were packing up to leave, he sure enough started bugling. As soon as it got super dark, he bugled several times. We got a couple of those on video. excited and we decided that night we talked about it on the video that hey we, we ought to come back here tomorrow the next morning getting all of our gear together
we sat there and glassed, and sure enough, we glassed up some more elk mm -hmm. on that ridge. Um, Probably about 150 yards above where we saw them. We uh, probably spent an 30 minutes after daylight mm -hmm. on that ridge glassing, and we saw those cows, and we uh, we hiked down, and we made it up maybe just the first ridge, and up to the top of the first ridge, and and uh, Jim called us and said, "Hey, I got a buck spotted. He looks like a pretty good buck." So Dale, being an awesome cousin, said he'd go with me to go try and see if we can't get on this buck. And we had to come up the back side of it because we didn't want a skyline and let the buck see us. When we came up and Dale was the first one to spot Jim and I'm sitting down and uh, I range him and he's, uh, the range I hit on the first deer is 333 yards and I'm looking, you know, in my scope and making sure it's level and getting set up and I'm uh, laying down in the dirt and uh, I get on this buck and Dale's helping me out. He's got the spotting scope out and he's... We're looking at him, and it's so thick. I'm like, all I can see is two points. I'm like, this is a little two-pointer. That buck turns he, sideways. He turns his head sideways, and I could clearly see in the spotting scope he was a nice four-pointer on yeah. one side. Yeah. I'm like, hey, I'm rock solid right now. I got my rest good. I got crosshairs on a chest of a yep, deer. Come on. So I just pulled the trigger. And that's awesome. So we know he's down. He's, he's good. This is who we have to thank for spotting him and telling us to come over. He was, uh, he was basically in the same area for, for the whole time within 30 yards of there yep all right guys so we lightened up our backpacks and we stashed all of our stuff up here because we have to come back up the same hill hope probably a couple times we're gonna go go see what we got uh, then we dropped off this steep steep ridge and went all the way down and we found them and we got them all cut up and the plan always was that we probably wouldn't make it in one trip <coughs> yeah we left the head in the cape and we came up, Jim, me, and Dale. Dale stood up on top, and you glassed a little bit more because still hunting left to be done. And uh, I went back down for the second trip to pick up the cape and the head. And then uh, I should have st stuck by that theory and said, "Okay, now that we have it all up on the ridge, and we're only we should take two trips." And I didn't. We loaded everything up, and it was painful, but that was a great, fun morning. Mm -hmm. So we were on the board in Wyoming at that point in time with a buck down. Success. Nice so. buck. So that night we went out and now we have this mysterious elk ridge that's got this really weird rock formation on it. It's the same exact rock formation that we discovered them on the first night. And so we decided to have our hunting party split into, I think it was three different groups. So we're all set in our different spots, but we've all got a little bit different vantage point on that mysterious little elk rock formation. And we were set there and glassed and glassed and glassed, and finally all of a sudden Joe said, Hey Dale, I see something. And he looks and we look at the top of the ridge, and sure enough, there was a cow elk up there at the top because she was up against that black looking dark timber. And we heard him bugling. We heard him coming. Mm, yeah. Remember that? Mm, we yeah, I heard, we heard a bugle before we saw the cows. And so then a cow comes out and she's grazing up and over the ridge line and we see another, um, it was a calf with her. And they just screwed around on that hilltop for what, 30, 45 minutes? They did. Because I kept thinking that that's where the rest of the herd's gonna well, come. Well, that's what I thought too. The, the herd's gonna follow suit. So I kept focusing on where those cows came out and anywhere around there. And so nothing happened, nothing happened. We're just bored looking at the cow and the calf and it's getting dark. It's I, I think I saw it just maybe like 10 seconds before you saw it. Mm -hmm. I looked over that rock and I'm like, wow, there's elk. There's just a flock of elk up there on that same point, on the same weird rock formation that they were when we saw them the first time. But then Josh has got a little bit different vantage yeah, point. I was down the ridge a couple hundred yards, but at just a different angle. I could see the bottom of the rock and I could see the bull. And the bull was running back and forth. He was running the cows my safety off and my finger on my trigger and i had my crosshair on that bull and he never once cleared a cow there was always either a cow behind him or a cow in front of him or when he ran in between cows it was just for a split <laughs> second and i was just following him and following him just like any second he I, it was a good 30 45 seconds where i'm just following everywhere he goes and he's never not covered up by there were so many cows but it was really fun to see those elk that yeah. night. Mm, it just got too dark. So the next morning, we don't leave elk to find elk. So we came down the same ridge again and sat up and started glassing again. And we started seeing cows 
Same spot. Same spot near that rock again. The magical elk rock. Yes. And Josh, Josh was a sharpshooter with his binoculars. This, I mean, he saw the elk a lot, and so he sees a cow, and so. I'm thinking, all right, I'm just I'm just gonna hurry up and get ready for a shot. I, I know it's a cow, but there could be a bull here. I just drop everything, I peel my pack off, and I get my bipod, and I run up the hill about 15 yards where I see a nice, nice clear opening with no branches in the way, and it's fairly flat. So I go prone, and I start ranging. I get some ranges while he's still glassing. He's still confirming their cows. He's getting some video of the cows. And I'm thinking, oh, it's, you know, I've turned on my, uh, my GoPro and I'm kind of just looking and I look at my binoculars and everything and I, I double check my ranges again you know like four different spots so I know if I see anything else and I'm like all right that's cows just cows but I'm just gonna hang out here for a little bit and all of a sudden I see another brown shape and this one comes up on the tip of this rock formation he walked right out to the end just like those six cows did all by himself and yeah. he looks out over the valley and at this time I mean it's that rocks 503 yards from where I was sitting and it's still really low light we thought it was a cow at first because I mean it was a, basically it was a spike but we didn't know it at the time and he's just messing around up there and then he turns around and turns his head and he looks back up where the cows are going back up over the hill and I think he got nervous that he was going to get left behind because <coughs> he turns around and he starts trotting away and when he does that he silhouettes against a dark tree and I'm like oh I can clearly see he's a spike mm -hmm. and so I make a million decisions in about five nanoseconds <laughs> and I'm like if he stops and gives me a shot I'm gonna take it and he didn't give you much no, of it he, he didn't he give you much, away. much time check out the footage Josh does an excellent job of filming this one and he starts walking up the hill away from me. First he's trotting and then he starts walking and then he's, he slows down and then he turns and he stops. And so he's like this from me, right? Yeah. He's a little bit quartered away, but yep. pretty much broadside. And so I've already dialed my yardage back in to the appropriate yardage knowing what that is. And I just take a super control, just like I've been practicing all summer long, just really nice slow squeeze shot and just hold it on the whole time, good follow through and it just center punched him. Oh. He just he just dropped. Unbelievable. Down for a while. I think he was probably stunned too because it was it went in the chest perfectly on one side, but since he was quartered away a little bit, it kind of went through and it went through a front shoulder on this side too. So um, that was probably a shock. And then he kind of came to a little bit and he started to struggle a little bit and he didn't look like he was going to get up, but then all of a sudden he did right himself and he was basically bedded and he looked like he was going to get up. And I'm like, I'm not, I don't want to chase an elk all day. Nope. If he's wounded. Nope. And I was already had another one in, and so I already took another shot. And I didn't tell anyone I was going to take that second shot. And Josh was filming. And I kind jumped. Of, kind of, and you put two bullets right perfectly through elk's chest at 525 yards back to back. So that's all our practice. It all it goes is, back to our is. practice and our research and getting the right ammo and and we feel comfortable at these ranges, right? That was I was super fantastic excited for you because that was an be incredible shot. Dropped him. He's down. Dropped him. That's the way you do it, Dale. And he turned almost completely broadside right before he was going to get behind some two thick of trees to shoot. So I just held it dead on him, took a big deep breath and just kept squeezing, squeezing, squeezing until that sucker surprised me when it went off and he dropped. He rolled down the hill a little ways and then he turned and he was fighting and he was trying to start to get up and he gave me another broadside shot so pretty sure I hit him with that second shot too. I think, just, I think you did too. Now he's laying down up there. I see his legs flickering every once in a while. But. Good shooting, Dale. Thanks, man. Thanks for spotting him. You know it. So, yeah, we I went back up and I backtracked when I went to go dress him out and I found where he was standing and I reverse ranged it and it was actually right at 545 yards. 545. Wow. 545. That's a good, that's a poke. It was fun. That was awesome. But uh, so the funny thing is, I'm just staring at the down spike and you guys start hearing a bugle yeah and you start looking around and across the canyon there's this beautiful meadow that's probably two thousand yards away it's something big. like that yeah and it's and a big meadow we could clearly see there was some elk running across this meadow and um we thought they were all cows we didn't have a spotting scope out yet so i dig it out for you guys to look and stuff like that 
Um, and we didn't know for sure until we were downloading and doing all the video footage editing today that one of those was a pretty big bowl. Yeah. Jim is always the wonderful helper that he always offers and he's all, well, I'm going to help you go take care of your elk. And I was like, well, why don't Josh and Joe, you guys go chase bugles. Yeah. I was like, we got some work, take, take your time getting over to us and then and we'll rendezvous with my, at my spike. So. Right, there's where he lays. He was, we actually spotted him. Not weird rock outcropping. It's like the Lion King movie with the lion up there, but except for it's elk. I love that little lookout point. Stomped flat trail. And that's where we saw him on that outcropping. Started walking up this trail, and I knew he was a spike. And he stood by that tree. So this is elk rock. This is where Dale shot his spike. And it's just amazing that these elk, for some reason, love walking out to this rock. The elk track in here is just pounded. Just unreal. Amount. Look at all the elk track. They love to come out on this rock. One evening we were watching and we, there was over six cows all right here, right on top of this rock, all on top of each other. All right. Here's my spike here in Wyoming and he was facing the other way here's the exit wound so I got lucky on that good shot all my preparation at the range and shooting long distance and doing my reloading seems to paid off to hit one this far away and it's a 300 wind mag so plenty of energy at that distance but uh, we've got quite a few ups and downs to get him back to our cabin so we've got a pretty full day ahead of us we got to cut up your bowl and mm -hmm. pack them out and two trips. Took two trips, yep. So. But we got a lot of good footage of even um, harvesting and, and cutting up that elk. Um, I'll split it off as a separate video too, but I did, when we watched the hunting video, there's like a fast forward version of our kind of Daniel relentless hunting method that we'd like to take game apart. But check out that little teaser, but then there's a whole bunch of other videos on how to do that for other kinds of game, deer, elk, and antelope and stuff too. Well, the technique works really well, especially if you're nowhere near a road, which is usually where you get your animal. Yeah. Thinking we're about done. To now start the hard part. I'm gonna go up and down, up and down, up and down and get back. Hey, got to work today. Beautiful so country though. So we hauled them all the way back and let's see, we shot them about 7.15 and I think our final low to me, we were back at the cabin by 2, 2.30 well, something one, like that. Wasn't too bad. So the next morning we went out and uh, <laughs> we walked all the way down to the bottom and cut across the flat and started going up the ridges. And uh, we heard a bugle in the distance and we went up over the first ridge and we thought, man, it just felt like it was right going to be right there. And we stopped. and. Dale, kept, Dale Dale was tagged out, so he was helping bugle. I was locate. So he'd locate, and then he'd bugle again. I'm like, oh, no, it's the next ridge. So we go down, go all the way across the flat, go up a steep hill, get to the top, stop. He'd locate, and we oh, he's right there on the bottom. And we dropped down in it real slow, and uh, I think about the third time we did that, we dropped into one, and I, I was really thinking he was in there. Mm -hmm. And we jumped an elk, and it was a cow. And we thought, oh, man, do we, did, are we busting them, mm -hmm. right? And she was, I think she was, she was all by herself. And uh, we went up the next ridge, and Dale did another locate bugle, and the answer was three ridges over. And we're like, oh. We were discouraged. We're like, that reminds you of Colorado. We are like, the elk just run. Holy cow, that thing was just, like, really? Like, it, when it answers earlier, it was, it was close. So we're like, okay, he's he's on a mission and he's going away from us. So at that point in time, we stopped and said, okay, well, uh, there's a big, huge ridge, a gigantic, big, huge mountain. We can go get up on top of it. We get up on top, and maybe they'll swing around. And get, let's go get elevation. Let's get elevation. Let's see what's going on. We can call from the top. And Yeah. 
guys. Uh, he's down on the ground, I think. Right there, baby. I say 470 yards. About 470. I think it's 466 of those trees. Here and we heard a bugle down the bottom, big, huge bugle over top. And I decided we're just gonna sit up here and try and see if we can get him to come in. And I was thinking he was a satellite bull. So we cow call and cow call and he'd bugle. But he wouldn't bugle that much. This big one over the ridge kept bugling more and more. So we're thinking he was a satellite. And uh, all of a sudden, he came out in the bottom, whole herd of cows, him walking out, and we could see the rat coming up behind him. They started coming up in the trees on the right, and I got real nervous they were just gonna disappear. And he stopped, he was the last one. I took a shot, a little bit hurried. I think I missed him on that one. And the whole herd came back across the field and gave me one last shot. Yes! Did you see him? I saw it all. I was watching. Oh, dude. Oh, my God. He looked like. Oh, he looked He looked nice. I guess at least it's six by six or maybe in a period. That was some fast shooting, man. 380? 470. All from over there. That's to the trees. I bet he was 500. I put 527 on him is what I put on him. Oh, because I, when, I, when I checked, it took me like 380 from where I was over That was fun. So then we celebrated a little bit and we hiked off that mountain, got down in there and uh, got to the bull. He uh, he was, I, I I don't know yet. I still, I have some questions I'm going to ask your dad, but I can't, he has a really nice front, his front forks or his front tines are really nice. His back end is pretty weak and for an elk to have 20 cows in this country, where we've seen big bulls, just he didn't quite have the mass that I thought he should have to be able to be a herd bull. But we're kind of thinking maybe he was an older bull that was regenerating a little bit. Um, and he, I think he has one point that's not broken. He was obviously a fighter. He broke out, his his right half is broken in half. He's got, he, he, he was probably a small six and he broke off the top of his left half. Mm -hmm. And every other every single one of his other tines have big huge chips and breaks in them. So he must have just been a bruiser, obviously. So which is cool. That's a cool trophy to have too. So and his body was ginormous. I have never seen an elk body so big. It took it took two of us to carry a hind quarter. Mm -hmm. The hind quarters were way over hundred pounds. Yeah. It, they were heavy big. I've processed a lot of elk. And when I was growing up and everything, and that's probably one of the biggest ones I've ever come across. From his ever. back, he, his hump on his back, from his backbone to his hump was like that. Mm -hmm. It was... The back strap was... <sighs> it was like... It, oh my yeah. gosh, it was taller. It was longer than <laughs> I was tall. So we, we, awesome. it took us a while to break down that animal. Yeah. We're, I'm starting to debone a hind quarter and the radio starts making noise and we're down in a hole. So I had to get up on top of a ridge and I get, it's Joe. Joe's calling me on the radio. So I told him what was going on. So we come back down and I sit back down again and we go back to work and we're deboning and we're just about done deboning. I radio starts making noise again. So go back up to the ridge and get back on the radio. And he says, I'm, uh, I'm heading down. I got two mules. Um, Heading, heading your direction. I just start fast I can, going mile and mile and a half back to meet those guys. Here comes Joe with the horses and the mules coming to save the day. And Joe was resourceful. Somehow he tracked down some pack mules for us. This is going to be way awesome. Even our packs are up there. I love mountains when they're high. Tall trees when they're green. 
Bright flowers when they're blooming in the spring Oh, well, when they bugle, I love deer When they run, yeah, I guess I'm just a mountain-loving man I love streams when they sparkle, rainbow trout when they jump, and coyotes when they're howling in the night. Big bears when they're growling, and their little cubs are fat. Yeah, I guess I'm just a mountain loving man. I love bighorns when they're climbing on their rocky mountain tops. Tall moose when they're eating willow grass. Red fox in the morning, jumping high with bushy tail. Yeah, I guess I'm just a mountain loving man. I love my mountain lady when she's smiling back at me. Makes me glad God gave her to me. When we're snowed in to our Wyoming is, usually doesn't disappoint. So. Yeah, it did not disappoint. Yeah. Alright guys, thanks for watching. See you next time.